It's not a color. It's not a race. It's not even a community of people. Black is a relationship with the bottom. It really only mattered to me the first time. I think one really sticks out for me and it was probably the first time. I do remember a time and it goes back all the way to like elementary school. When I was growing up, I remember the first thing that ever happened to me, I was about four years old. I was about seven, I think it was. We were getting bus down to a school. And it was probably when I was about seven or eight years old, maybe a six, whatever. Where I had a teacher in sixth grade, sixth or seventh grade, uh, I had a friend of mine who actually lived in a suburb of Rochester, New York, where I'm from. We lived on this Air Force base temporarily when we moved to Oakland, California. It was in Brownsville where I grew up, but we got bussed down to, I think that was the Crown Heights section, beginning with Crown Heights in Brooklyn. In Chicago, in a Korean-owned beauty supply store, and I was in there with my mother. And I remember one time I was playing by myself, there was this big puddle. You know, you play with toys inside the water like you're playing in a big lake or whatever the puddle's supposed to represent. One particular day, there was a girl that I used to play around with a lot, and we decided to be boyfriend and girlfriend, so. You know, as a child, you're just walking around using your imagination, doing whatever have you. And I remember these four white kids came up to me, range, I would say, about seven or eight years old, and I remember them calling me the, a word I never heard before, a nigger. And I don't know, this girl, I don't know what happened or if there was an exchange of words, but then the girl just came out of nowhere and she just called me a nigger. And I kept noticing that the woman, the women that ran the store, was at the end of every aisle that I would be at. Who would turn my desk upside down and dump all of my books in the middle of the classroom. I can't remember her name now, but I told him, you know, what her name was. And he said, oh, he said, she can't be your girlfriend. And I said, why not? And he said, because she's white and you're black. I'll never forget that, because I know what it meant. And I just remember they pushed me around and threw me into the puddle. As time went on and on, she started getting closer to me and watching me in these aisles. And then, uh, you know, I thought to myself, I was like, is it because of something I did? And then my mother explained to me prejudice and those sorts of things and that's what you're going to end up seeing in life and at the time i thought i was like oh well i deserved it or i felt like i was wrong but in retrospect i contributed that to being black and i think it was one of those things where you've heard about it and but you're so young that you've never really experienced it and i just i wanted to punch her in the face i'm not gonna lie and that's the first time i ever heard anything like that the fact that i was different from anybody else it gave me that sense of, you know, there is some sort of, uh, people pass some sort of judgment on people, you know, because of the color of their skin or, or who they are. That was the first time I ever felt different than, you know, than someone else. It bothered me a lot. So I, from that time on, I was always conscious of what people were saying about the races and things like that. But as I, go through life, I just look at it as that person's loss and not necessarily anything that had to do with me at all because in all reality, it has nothing to do with me. I guess I still, every once in a while, get reminded that like everybody, no matter what I do, almost everybody in my life perceives me slightly differently just for being black. If I'm like writing an email or I'm going to approach somebody, the first thought that comes to mind is, okay, how, does that sound aggressive? I don't want to make them think like that I'm being an angry black man. It's always been innuendos and very subtleties. It's not been outright. It's not like I've never been, I've never been pulled over by the cops. I've never been put in a lineup. The implicit uh, racism was the one that kind of probably got the most attention from me. Um, realizing like, wow, like people's perceptions of you, uh, how you look, how you act, things like that. A lot of my classmates, I was probably the first person of color that they befriended. Like, I yeah. wasn't someone that they saw in a rap video, you know, or playing a sporting event. 
Like it's a defining thing about me, even though it tells them almost nothing about me. It's a very subtle thing, and you know, people will have expectations or make assumptions based on you know what they think your educational background is. You know, you get to that point where you think like, oh, am I not as good as I think I am, or is it because I'm black? One story that I can remember pretty well is that uh, I had this advisor in college. I was working my day job. There was a, a fellow who was a really nice guy. We had a really, you know, like, good relationship. I have a lot of friends who are white. They're friends of mine and they respect me as a human being, but at the same time, they will have a, uh, a prejudice or, or a misconception or a stereotype. I was in college and I had a professor who uh, had a, a photography course that was very popular and um, I really wanted to be in the course. And it's a group interview. So we gotta pretend to be these animals and we gotta do all these different things to get the job. It's a personality test or whatever they run. One day he pulled me and one other uh, black student aside. He just said, you know, I just came from this meeting about minor getting more minorities interested in science. I am just so happy to have minorities in my lab because they all bring, you know, a different, a different perspective and a diversity to like my science. One day he says something to, to me, something along the likes of like, you're like the whitest black guy I know. You know, you just don't talk like a black guy. You know, so, so this guy went to MIT, but was he an affirmative action guy? You know, I mean, you get that. And it's not like, you know, people don't have to say anything. And many people felt like, oh, well, you know, you just got in because you're black or you took, you know, you took my spot. She told me specifically, uh, she said, um, let me let you know that you're, you're going to get in this class because of who you are. So I passed this thing with flying colors. The lady lets me know, hey, we're going to offer you a job. Story gets interesting when the job offer comes. They discover that I'm African-American, and the quote that was used is, we filled our African-American quota. He meant that as a compliment. Like, he was, he thought that was great. He thought it was a win-win for everybody, you know. And I just remember thinking, like, man, this guy who I thought of as my mentor, um, and somehow that my science was different, my, my bi biology, my test tubes, all that sort of stuff, was somehow different in his mind <laughs> than someone else's based on something that has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, what I know or what I can do. The point he was making was that black people are not articulate, they're not well-spoken, they don't have a mastery of the English language, you know, my native tongue, because um, I was born here. I don't think I'm a very sensitive person, you know, I'm not just walking around thinking, oh, this guy just slighted me uh, and it's because I'm black, you know. Back then I was young, I didn't know what that meant, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I was a little naive, so, um, I didn't know how to take it, but now I, I totally understand what that meant. And um, it was racist, I feel like, but I don't, I don't know how much that she felt it was racist. Maybe she thought she was doing a service or something like this. I didn't get the job for that reason. I was later told it was because they had already chosen other candidates, but a supervisor let me know what was said and, and what pretenses it was used. So we need no more blacks in here. If he's a black guy, do not send him this way. You have a person who is my friend every day who comes and talks to me and comes to me in class and he'll still say some shit where it's like, yo, it's, I, I don't know where that came from. I, I don't know because. Like, and I thought I was just a scientist. <laughs> I thought I was just, I thought I was just maybe even the best scientist in his lab. But to him, I was a black scientist. What I, what I took from him is when he thinks of black people or African Americans, he's he sees them void of that very basic ability to master a language. And that has a host of other implications as well. You know, what else might not I be capable of achieving, you know, in, in his eyes? It was surprising to even hear that amongst a bunch of people who answered questions wrong during this interview didn't get the gist of why they were being asked the questions that they were being asked and then for that to be said about someone who's considered a good candidate i'm like that's crazy i remember like coming in and i'll come in like a collared shirt and and like jeans people just like mm, you don't look like 50 cents so you're not really black i was like are you fucking kidding me like that's not a thing to say to a person and 
you know, and it's the same thing all the time. Every time one of my bosses confuses me with someone else that I work with who's also a minority, um, even though we don't look alike at all, you know, every time I'm walking in a store and even though I'm pushing a shopping cart and carrying a bunch of things, someone asks me questions like I work there, like, you know, you just sort of come up against it all the time where people just assume so much about you based on something that means so little. For a while, for a couple of years, I kind of thought of it as this reverse racism is what I called it. It was like, wow, you're really smart for a black guy. You know, it's like, that's racist. And then there's something that's very subtle, racism. Uh, I think there's a new word for it now. Sociologists call it microaggression or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, whoa, yeah. heavy discrimination. Because I have friends who are like, what is it like growing up in the Bronx? Is it dangerous? You know, yeah. do people run around with guns? Like, you know, things that normally would be offensive to people. For me, I'm, I looked at it as an opportunity for dialogue. It always makes me feel very limited, very like limited for something that I can't control. Um, and it kind of, kind of makes me angry sometimes. <laughs> I try to not look at it in a way where I, I was upset about it. it. It speaks, it's symptomatic of a larger issue, which is the portrayal of African-Americans. You know, because just as a curious about me, I'm like, okay, what was it like growing up in Vermont, around Cowsel, and, you know, skiing? You know, I'm a kid from the city, so I think I cultivated a lot of amazing relationships through those experiences, but I also learned more about myself. You know, the media, how we're portrayed, the, the TV shows that you see us on, and, you know, like, you know, the tomfoolery, you know, that takes place in those, and, the, you know, the type of stuff that you see in movies. And, of course, there's the music and, you know, and, and things like that. We filled our black quota, like, okay, you know what, we're only doing this because we have to. Sorry that happened. <laughs> I've moved on to bigger and better things. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, man. We're not as equal as white people. So, like, you have to try harder. Uh, oh, it's, it's like, it's, it's something that every time I have to give that advice, it's, I'm sickened by. Like, like, I have to try harder than someone who, like, it's, it, but, like, that's, it's the truth. And I think that's kind of made it easier for me to sympathize with people who take those kind of positions. And when you can sympathize, you can start to, it's a little easier to form uh, an approach of how you can help the person. If you're sympathizing, you're saying, okay, well, clearly something's wrong on your side of the equation, on your side of the table. How can we begin to bridge the gap? And that becomes very empowering as opposed to feeling like a victim. One of the only times I've ever had a gun pulled on me was by a cop. We walked down the Prospect Park because we couldn't afford to get on the bus, so we walked down Eastern Parkway which is now interracially mixed, but back then it was predominantly Jewish. It was me, my brother, and a friend of mine, and we were walking out of the house. We hadn't been outside more than 10 minutes. I was driving down from New York, where I was going to school and college, down to Virginia, where I'm from. Uh, one evening, I'm leaving my house, going to my girlfriend's house. And the cops kept stopping us and said, where are you going? We said, well, we're going to Prospect Park. And he says, well, why are you walking down here? We were about 10, 15 feet away from the, the front door and squad car rolled up, detective car rolled up on the sidewalk. Uh, van rolled up, they came out full force. I was going over one hill, I see an officer down there and I'm clearly checked every time I see an officer, yeah, I check my speed. I'm going, the speed limit of course. Coming down one of the blocks, I noticed a, an unmarked car, it was a, a truck, uh, I think it was a Jeep Cherokee, that the new one, one of the new ones that they, they ride around in nowadays. You know, we showed ID, we were from the building, that should be the end of it. And we said, no, we're, we're just walking because we can't afford to get on the bus. So he would say, well, make sure you go straight there. Don't go to the left or go to the right. Make sure you go straight to Prospect Park. So we said, yes, sir. And they pulled up behind me and they flashed their lights. The officer approaches the car and he says, um, where are you coming from? You know, they flipped us up, they checked us out. Where does that come from? My, my building's not a traffic building. There's no, there's, it's a private building. He was saying something to the effect, you know, nice registration, hand that over. And then he starts to then make assertions and assumptions on my behalf. We got stopped like, I would say four or five times along the route. Maybe it's like a five mile walk. And we, they kept stopping us. 
so there's no suspicion of anything but other than being colored and hopefully they can get a couple collars to get their numbers up before they take it in because it was late they said well we just got a call in that someone has a car someone that has a car just like yours just got into a fight and beat up a spanish guy knocked him clean out and he goes uh have you been smoking or anything like that now that started changing the tone and tenor of his conversation because i no sir and i'm curious to why he assumed something of that nature and i told him i said well i can reassure you that that wasn't me i just left my house i'm just coming to my girlfriend's house you know standing in the wrong place at the wrong time can get you treated terribly and that's not good if no one's doing anything at that point he reaches into the vehicle scratches away at the area of the phone padding on that had been breaking off he goes Are you sure i mean this what is this and i'm going well from what i can assert that is the phone padding of my center console they said can i see your license and registration please and i asked the officer what did i do you know he he couldn't answer the question the police officers even back then had a preconceived notion about black children of black people in general so he repeated himself again and i said what did i do wrong so he said, um, what you're doing wrong now is, is you're not giving me your information. And uh, from there he's going, okay, well, and he starts trying to look in the back seat and everything else. Now it already was a red flag for me that he was partially, he came inside my windshield. So to avoid any other trouble, I gave him my information and he looked at it and he asked me to step out the car. I obliged because I, I learned early on as a young man in the South, you can disagree with an officer, but uh, certain demographics don't have the viability to disagree the same way, say, other demographics do. So you always stay pleasant. I just feel like it's always a, it's always a, a question of when. You know what I mean? It's not a matter of, you know, of I hope not. It's just when. You know, when, when, when does my number pop up on, you know, the I'm going to fuck with him list? So I stepped out the car. Lights are shining on me. About six other officers hop out of another car, all undercover cops, hop out of another car, and they approach my car, and they pat me down. And they ask me if they're, if they're gonna be stuck by anything, do I have any guns, do I have any drugs in the car? It becomes so normal that that's just how everything is. And I, I think that comes from the way you're raised and brought up. The guy that I was originally talking to asked me to sit at the trunk of my car. So I sat at the trunk of my car while four other officers surrounded me. At that point in time, he walks around to the back trunk of my car and begins lifting on the trunk. The spoiler, he kind of pulls up on it. I'm guessing to attempt to see if my trunk was open. He doesn't have that right. I didn't give him permission to start search my car, but he searched it anyway. I look at some of my friends who may not be, you know, aware enough, you know, who, are, who aren't so selective of how they talk and the little manners. It's the very little things that you know, I constantly see the police take and run with because they approach the situation aggressively. But at this point now, it's he's fishing. So my girlfriend and her family came out and they were, you know, asking questions. What happened? What did he do? I've done nothing. They'll, they'll mess with me, but they may not mess with me so much as my friend because he's a little darker or because, you know, he's a little less articulate or whatever the case may be. And that's not right. Then he says, oh, well, you can go back into your car. As I was sitting on the trunk, one of the officers were asking me, you know, what do you do, you know, where do you work? And I was honest. I told him I work, you know, for J.P. Morgan Chase, and I have a great job. You know, where'd you get this car? It's my car. I bought this car. Is it, are you sure? Yeah. The part that left a bad taste in my mouth, though, is he really wanted to, and the vernacular he was using, he wanted to make it seem like he was doing me a favor by giving me a warning. Well, you're lucky you're not like this because we would do that. And I'm like, wow, I am lucky I'm not like that because you would totally violate me for nothing. Are you sure that you didn't have any fights tonight? Are you sure you didn't beat anybody up? And I showed him my hands and I said, you know, if I beat anybody up, you would see scratches or scars or something. You know, it's not that we need to learn how to deal with the police, but I feel like we need to cater to their egos almost too much to the point where we're getting mishandled and mistreated just to satisfy someone's entertainment. But I'm pleasant. I'm pleased that it went the way it did because I also know how easily it could have gone the other way. After that, they said, all right, you're good to go. They gave me back my information. It's to the point where when I see someone getting stopped by the police, I start recording just because. Someone should. And how many times it, for a lot of guys, has gone the other way. There are officers out there who are 
seeing a, a, a black man in a nice car, you know, and then, you know, they wanted to pull me over because of that. You know, I did nothing wrong. The wrong action could have brought other consequences, but it always made me aware, and maybe a little paranoid that I'm always being watched and every activity that I do will have me scrutinized in a way that can quickly and easily become uh, life-threatening. You know, and I would hope if I was in a shady situation with some cops, somebody would too. And unfortunately, I cannot assert myself as a young man the same way anybody would else to expect to be able to. You know, and it happens all the time, and we shouldn't accept it. It's not right. But if it's a burden I gotta take, and I have to teach my sons until it's no longer the case, um, I will. I think racism is like a disease, you know? It's like a tumor or a cancer, and it, it grows inside of you. You know, if you don't take care of it, it will just get worse and it can kill you and you can even affect other people. Though we use it as a, an identity for ourselves in terms of skin color, it's really an identity in terms of status, class, and a representation of what we know as the bot. Do we view ourselves as equals? And what does that mean? For me, it's a fact of life, no more, no less. It's just how the world works. They, they're not actively trying to make it that way. Um, it's, and we should every day fight to fix that. But in the meantime, between time, I'm gonna to have to work hard to make sure that my sons and everyone else's sons, no matter what they look like, get a fair justice system that's gonna treat you know everyone else the same. And there's no simple answer. But at least if you like, have a little bit of patience, we'll have something constructive. There's, there's no way we should, we have to have equality. We have to fight for equality. You know, I try to always put stereotyping and racism and bigotry and a lot of the other ills, you know, of society in the context of class. And, you know, hopefully the community that views everybody the same, because if I do wrong, I expect it to be punished for being wrong. But if I'm doing right, I don't expect to be punished. I never taught my children to distinguish among races. I always taught them everybody's the same, you all bleed the same, you're different colors, different shades, but it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, you know, we are one family.